Hi, I'm, I'm Matthew Holt, and I'm back, from those of you who remember. Okay, so uh, time to wake up. Everyone stand up. Come on. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stretch. Oh, never touch your toes. If you can. Oh, okay, okay that, that's enough. Well done. All right. That is the healthiest thing any of you will do today. <laughs> All right. So um, I was going to come. I, I want to really thank again uh, Rasmina and uh, M uh, um, Maria for inviting me. And I said, great, I'll come and I'll talk all about AI. And they said, well, we've got this guy, Scott Amex, he's going to do that. So no, I'll talk all about VR. And they said, yeah, we've got this guy, Shafi Ahmed, he's going to do that. So uh, uh, what should I talk about? So, so I'll do the entire past, present, and future of healthcare in like 10 minutes. So you ready? <laughs> OK, uh, I love showing this photo because once upon a time I had hair. Um, and I've been doing this for a relatively long time. I was a futurist back when I took this photo. Um, but then a little while later, I started the blog on healthcare, called the Healthcare Blog, first major blog doing healthcare policy and business in the US. Back in 2003, first month, I think my dad, he just retired, so he had plenty of time to go and read some, uh, some blog posts. That's why I only had a few visit visitors that month. All right. And I was always worried about being a blogger that nobody would trust me. And then I found this poll from the BBC which showed that's true. The least trusted people in media were internet bloggers. The only thing to, to, to be said in our favor is that we were less distrusted than people's friends, families, and colleagues. So think about that for a minute. All right. OK. These days, I run the Health 2.0 conference. Uh, I'm still running the healthcare blog. And I now do consulting the startups in Silicon Valley, uh, my new, uh, new company, Smack Health. But really, here I'm here going to tell you for the most of this presentation, run really quickly through the past the alternate past, the present, the alternate present, and a bit about the future of healthcare. And some big general, general, generalities to put us in the, in the track we are today. All right, so here's the past. We started with technology, right? What's the best first technology in healthcare? Of course it was the kings got treated by their barbershop surgeons with leeches. And people are still using leeches in healthcare, believe it or not. Um, but we have seen also the development of the hospital. This is the Hospice de Beaune in Burgundy in France, very nice place, put up together by some monks and the Duke of Burgundy. Of course, if you got into this hospital, you were going to die, because that's what hospitals were for most of the, the times, places where people went to die. What's happened is we've had a whole generation of technology, starting with some fake technology, like this snake oil, sold well in the American West in the, uh, in the, uh, the 18, 1870s through to the 1890s, but gradually changed by people like this. This, is, uh, this may be Shafi Ahmed's first day of medical school, I don't know, possibly not. <laughs> but the profession of medicine um, has slowly advanced science over all that stuff. So if you had profession plus technology, things like the x-ray machine, this is the early version of the anesthesia. Um, this guy is William Halstead, very well-known cocaine and morphine addict, but also the guy who primarily invented surgery in the US, at Johns Hopkins, the father of surgery in America. Uh, technology, techniques, more technology. This is an iron lung to dealt with, with, with for those of people who had polio back in the day in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Hospitals were stuffed full of kids in these things, breathing for them. Of course, Jonas Salk invented the polio vaccine, and polio is almost unknown now. Um, and then, of course, drugs. This is Alexander Fleming, um, the inventor of penicillin, the discoverer of penicillin. So all these technologies were brought, were brought together uh, in a whole new way. Then, of course, the biggest thing that happened to healthcare was these guys, the Beatles. You know why the Beatles? OK, EMI was their record company. It made so much money off the, off the Beatles. They had this guy, Godfrey Hansfield, just sort of hanging out doing R&D. And he invented the CT scanner. Now we have MRIs, PET scanners, and much more. So we have imaging technology along with drugs. All this amazing stuff has developed the technology that we know uh, today, which is the main healthcare system, all the stuff that goes on in our big medical palaces. palaces. There is, though, other stuff hidden in the past with these mysterious medical figures, some of whom may or may not you know, actually have their second coming in our future. So anyone know what this is a, a chart of? Ah, the entrepreneurs quoted back. I invented this great phrase called entrepreneurs, but apparently somebody already, Schwann already invented it. This is indeed, this is Florence Nightingale looking at the, uh, the British troops in hospital and the death rates and what was going on with the death rates back in the Crimean, Crimean War in the 1850s. Uh, she actually came out with this brilliant phase, phrase, just look at this. Hospitals are an intermediate stage of civilization. Perhaps there'll be a time when every poor sick person will have the opportunity of a share in a district sick nurse at home. Can we bring health care to the home? So think about that. She's pretty prescient thinking about that maybe 200 years earlier. OK, she wasn't the only person. This is a chart from uh, uh, the hospital in Vienna in the 1840s. The two different clinics doing childbirth. One of them had a much, much worse death rate. Anybody know why? 
in faction, right? This is a guy called Ignaz Semmelweis, who was, a, who was a gynecologist, a surgeon who figured it out. It was that the midwives in the one clinic washed their hands. The surgeons didn't believe in that hand-washing stuff. So he actually tried hard to get all the rest of the surgeons to wash their hands. They all told him to go stick, go stick it. He was actually taken to a lunatic asylum because <laughs> he couldn't convince anybody. And he died there, even though now in Budapest, medical school is named after him. So, and here's another uh, great uh, seer of the future. This is Ernest Amory Cobman. Back in 1917, he developed an app. You know what an app looks like, right? This is an app. Okay, this is uh, his is, 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 uh, uh, report card that he filled in for every surgery. He tried to get every surgeon in Boston to fill a report card to show their outcomes of what their care was. Um, surprisingly enough, he also got blackballed <laughs> and was basically discredited in, in his day, even though now, again, he's, he's uh, uh, well regarded as being one of the first people to care about outcomes. Okay, not the only person who was ahead of his time. Uh, 1968, a guy called Larry Weed wrote an article about electronic medical records. 68 was a long, long time ago. Do you remember what else was happening around there? 68, 69, man landed on the moon. This is Neil Armstrong. He actually fairly relatively recently, a few years ago, died. Um, so this is, you know, back in, in ancient history. But by the way, do you guys know the Neil Armstrong story? Okay, one minute digression on Neil Armstrong story. So you remember that <coughs> small step for man, <coughs> great step for mankind. Later on in all those transmissions, he went, <coughs> Congratulations, Mr. Gorski. And like years later, people are trying to figure out what the hell was he talking about? Who is this Mr. Gorski? What was going on? And eventually, quite close to his death, he was at a dinner and he was asked who Mr. Gorski was. He said, well, okay, I've never told this story, but I'll finally tell you because, you know, everyone else in the story is dead and I'm close to dying. So here's, the, here's what happened. So he said, I was playing ball with my brother back in Ohio and my ball went into the neighbor's yard. And I went into the neighbor's garden to go get it. And it was the elderly couple next door, Mr. and Mrs. Gorski, and they were having a massive argument. And Mrs. Gorski was saying to Mr. Gorski, oral sex, oral sex, you want oral sex? I'll give you oral sex today. The kid next door walks on the moon. <laughs> oh. Distraction, distraction. OK, let's do the present real quick. Uh, we've had these massive healthcare systems evolve. The one in the UK is so famous that in 2012, it was a huge part of the Olympic opening ceremony. The greatest, the greatest thing the British could think to say about themselves was the NHS. It's probably true. Similar versions have grown up around sickness funds in Germany. The US has a completely crazy system, but it's even bigger. Um, and we spend a shitload of money on them. Uh, the Americans, being for a bunch of uh, historical reasons, spend a lot more because of the crazy system. But even the sensible Europeans are spending a lot more than they were over time. These numbers are going up as a share of GDP. Actually, I had that chart for America. Why did that work in America? This is the formula that shows the shape of that line. I equals a function of, F, uh, of uh, PDI, M5B, and MBZ, because I is the increase in healthcare costs. PDI is how much the physician wants to make. M5B is the cost of a mortgage payment on a five-bedroom house with a pool, and MBZ is the monthly lease on a 300 series Mercedes, right? <laughs> the more you do in healthcare, especially in the US, the more you make. And that's been the problem. We have healthcare systems which are sucking up uh, huge amounts of society's dollars and, and, and money and euros into these systems. We also have another problem, which is that in most areas of life, if you pay more for something, you get higher quality. So a Motel 6, a cheap motel, it costs less, but it's worse than a Four Seasons hotel. <clears throat> these are US data, but they uh, go everywhere. We have completely the inverse, uh, inverse uh, relationship. Quality often is more ex uh, it's cheaper, um, higher cost uh, care um, is actually worse quality. This is uh, some data coming from the, 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 the Dartmouth group in the US, but it's replicated across many, many countries. Okay, what else are we not doing well? We are, in general, not looking after people with chronic illness well. Here's a whole uh, bunch of work done with the Commonwealth Fund a few years back, looking at the bottom line, the yellow is, have you done all these three things well? What's the answer? The answer is, we need significant improvement to how we do chronic care. So that's what we've got to do. We are, however, seeing the tsunami of elderly people of chronic disease. Maybe we are going back to head off a cliff, and we really are looking for one of these. This is the, uh, the, the paddle store at Shit Creek. <laughs> okay. However, we've got some alternate stuff going on in the present, all right? So one thing is we have consumers. Back in the 1970s, this is 1973, the Women's Collective Group at Boston put together Our Bodies Ourselves. This is the first consumer-led movement, and that's been growing dramatically over the last 40 years. The other thing we've had growth is in, uh, well, anyone know what this is? OK, I'll give you a hint. Do you think it's uh, a model of the early first robotic locust? 
Model for a kid's toy? Model for the first brain transplant? Any guesses? Any, any, any? Okay. Do you remember War Games, the, uh, the movie? The answer in War Games is the answer is not on the list. That, of course, is a model of the first transistor. Without a transistor, we wouldn't have TVs, we wouldn't have computers, we wouldn't have cell phones, we wouldn't have the iPad, we wouldn't have cool stuff like Google Glass and watches and all that kind of stuff. What we got out of transistors was not all the use of that in healthcare. What we did eventually get was primary care and now secondary care electronic medical records, big iron. Um, we got far more of that, by the way, in countries that started with N, like uh, the Netherlands, Norway, New Zealand. We got less of that in, uh, in the US and elsewhere. But now basically everyone's up to date and we now have electronic medical records, big enterprise data. The question is, what are we gonna do with all this stuff in the future? All right, so I've got about two minutes to tell you about the future, so <laughs> let's see how I do. So of course these days you can buy stuff, you can tell anybody, you can go anywhere, and you can get laid just from your cell phone. It's fantastic. That's kind of like the future already, where all the stuff you're seeing outside and you've heard about in the stage and the AR and the VR is basically bringing this to healthcare. We've talked a lot about two aspects of healthcare. One is, can you make healthcare simple? Can you make it easy? Can you make it a consumer good? Can you make it immediate, um, like, like the Uber of healthcare? In fact, funnily enough, at Health 2.0, we had so many people coming to us a few, few years back saying that we have the Uber of healthcare. We started taking a bet on how many people would apply. Um, and in fact, you can see that Emily, who was halfway down there, she won because 11 people came to us saying for the conference they were the Uber of healthcare. And the week after the conference, Uber announced Uber healthcare. So I would have won at 12, but <laughs> anyway. You also starting to see consumer services, things like really high-end, uh, really high-end uh, amenities coming into healthcare. This is. Does anyone know what this is? This look like a Ritz Carlton sort of waiting, a Ritz Carlton uh, foyer or something. This is the waiting room for one medical in San Francisco. It's a really fancy upscale primary care group um, for care. So we're kind of taking care in some ways in healthcare. We're starting to get the tools, as L3 yesterday said, for the fat my white, middle-aged, healthy, rich people across the world, we're starting to see those t services develop, we're starting to see that come into healthcare. So expect a lot more of that in the future. But that's only a small part of the future of healthcare. The bigger part is the stuff we don't talk about. Okay. We have what we've called, uh, my friend Alex Drain, it's called the unmentionables, which is all the things that impact your health that are going on in the world, going on in life, including financial stress, job stress, not getting good enough sex, not having social support, not being able to do exercise, all these types of things which are impacting health and are impacting people's conditions and leading to really uh, exceeding the, 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 the problems caused by chronic care. How are we gonna fix that? I'm back to Florence Nightingale again, Nightingale again. How can we do get the entrepreneurs? How can we get people to uh, get at, at people in their homes, in their real life being sick? So here's one way I think it's gonna end, and I'm gonna end with this. We start off with, with, uh, with, with care delivery. Care delivery these days is the, the epicenter of, of healthcare. And we add stuff to that. We run, put services around it. And eventually now we're putting tech platforms, you know, electronic medical records to take track of what we've done in our care delivery. What I think is now happening is that technology is going to help us in the future flip that on, on the head. There's a whole bunch of stuff being bundled up in these tech platforms that's going to start unbundling. We have new types of data storage like blockchain. We have new types of transaction layers moving data, around, um, uh, enabling us to, to, to record and order stuff. We have new types of data exchange, uh, things like uh, technologies like Fire. We have all the new weird and wonderful data analytics and the big data we've heard about. And we're going to build new interface layers, including Siri and Amazon Alexa and Voice and all other kinds of tools, chatbots, to get information and access to that. And these tech platforms have become so powerful, I believe they're going to start delivering care. You're going to start seeing the tech platforms with services built around them and eventually care delivery being a thin slice on the top. And I think that we're going to see institutions and organizations change over to deliver that. And that's going to be the future of care, care and future of healthcare. And if that doesn't work, we don't merge all these things together. We can always go back to the NHS of figuring out an easy way to tell you about how to do health care right. So that's the past, present, and future care. Future of health care. Thanks a lot.